We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with Spencer Hillegas of Madison Investing. Spencer, how are you? I'm doing great, Casey, because I get to have a conversation like this with you. Honored to be here. Absolutely, man. We're certainly glad to have you. And I know that uh, with the business the way it is and everybody seems to be just completely swamped, I'm glad you could carve out enough time to give us a little insight into you and Madison Investing and what you all do and how you do it. So why don't, uh, why don't we start by giving the audience just a little background on you, who you are, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Well, and again, thanks for having me, Casey. I think, Absolutely. I mean, I love talking about this stuff. I know that uh, waking up every morning, talking to investors about things as fun and exciting that I think are exciting, like large apartment communities, self-storage facilities, investing in alternative things. I think that's a joy. And I never thought, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that, that this would be my daily life. Um, yep. So, you know, so, these days I run Madison Investing, as you mentioned, a couple hundred uh, and actually more uh, investors that work with us, passive investors. We put our own money where our mouth is, you know, put skin in the game yep. and deals. Prior to that, I was in 13 years of leadership gigs uh, across Silicon Valley tech companies. You know, so I worked with wow. five different fintech companies, um, building operations groups and teams uh, and doing all that leadership learning and management didn't quite prepare you for what it takes to go build actual wealth, of course. And sure. that's really where I aim to help and serve our investors now is really just helping them kind of get the light bulb spark moment that I got way too late despite growing up in a real estate household. Uh, you know, my dad was yep. a broker for 30 years. I used to be embarrassed to tell my friends that I worked in a real estate business because the cool thing to tell your friends in California in the Bay Area in particular is, oh, I worked for a tech company and not quite as cool to tell you. <laughs> I worked for my dad's uh, real estate business and I got to go clean out an old fridge to, to prepare the property for sale next weekend, guys. You know, so yep. flash forward, just gets to go out and help people every single day who are already working professionals or independently wealthy entrepreneurs, et cetera, of all corners of the U.S. Just try to invest better, particularly now, you know, per the sure. comment that you made kind of leading into our discussion today, Casey. It's a confusing time out there, but our investment thesis doesn't need to change just because uh, the headlines tend to make it more confusing for folks. And there's a few things about money getting more expensive out there. Yeah. 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 And, you know, the other part of that too, the confusing times, and I think what, I think what confuses the market a lot, I was having a discussion last night with, uh, and as of recording, I always like to, when we start having discussions about, you know, this is mid August, um, so that when this actually airs, people can look back and say, Hey, these guys aren't crazy. They're, they were talking back then, not today. So, um, so the difference, the reason why I think there's some confusion in, in the way the market is right now is if you read like, for instance, the Wall Street Journal, right? There's, there's, a, there's a massive pool of private equity that's just like just hanging out. It's not doing anything. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. like there's private equity ready to go into deals, right? And then, but the, the reason why it's confusing the market, I think, is because that pool is there. And everybody hears about it. They talk about it. The news is saying, hey, these private equity guys are not investing. But what I tried to tell him last night when we were talking was there is a difference between that private equity pool and the retail capital that that a lot of us guys are after. Because we don't we don't want I like, for instance, my business model is anti-institutional money. Now, I'm not saying that if you get into a deal and you need to raise $3 million extra that you wouldn't potentially take that route or at least investigate possibly getting a bigger player in there to finish it up. But what I'm saying is for the most part, 
we're not after institutional money. And that over there is institutional money because not all capital mm -hmm. is created equal. That's institutional money. They're going to want control. They're going to want a lot of say so. They're going to want their, the the business plan is too many too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Now, when you come back and you say, okay, then these retail guys, and you're like, hey, I don't. That's why. So do you see where I'm saying like how the market could get how people from the outside looking in could be confused and say, hey, this 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 capital deal is really weird right now, but there's still retail capital out there. Oh, 100 percent. And I really appreciate talking about this level of it and layer of it, Casey. I mean, um, sometimes, you know, you and I probably connect with, you know, hundreds of, you know, uh, retail investors, just as you mentioned earlier for the audience. You know, I know you probably have a pretty sophisticated audience, but retail investors just can mean anyone ranging from, hey, full time employee. Like, here's an example of an actual investor with us, like to dual income making 400 each W2 income, yep. senior software engineers at a top five tech company. That's a retail investor all the way up to yep. the folks who are not quite that family office level, but they have a very substantial footing financially. So they're doing fine. They don't need to work, um, but that's yep. a broad range. And all that said, it is very confusing for the average investor, for the average retail investor to read a headline and have it say, hey, look at this investment capital just kind of sitting there getting dusty because there's a big moment that institutional investors are waiting for. And just to echo, yep kind of echo your sentiment on institutional versus retail. You know, I believe wholeheartedly in there is not going to be an easy path forward unless we fight for it for the average retail investor to get access to great alternative investments, unless we all collectively keep building them and, and, and educating yeah. on them, you know, and institutional investors are very well footed and they know how to go out and scoop up great deals more and more so. And that's the way the wind is blowing. So I'm deeply passionate about hooking them people up and curating and vetting these things thoroughly, uh, which is why we have a yeah. business, I think. <laughs> well, and there could be, there could be an opportunity here approaching or fast approaching really for the syndicate, because basically I look at it in levels. Basically you have your, your guys, like I think, a lot of us used to be, or, or, or a lot of the audience could possibly still be single family people who own single family homes that rent them out. Uh, you know, each home has a roof, a HVAC, a, to a couple toilets and whatever, right? Then you step into the syndications and the syndication world is kind of the next level of saying, okay, hey, these are, in my opinion, uh, some, some classic type apartment buildings that were built, say, 80s. 80s, 90s, and then mid 90s, whatever. Then you step into institutional quality stuff, which is like big Miami. I mean, just just big kind of blocks of these apartment buildings, right? The the hundred million dollar deals. Yeah. And so, when you start trying to feed our side of things, it, it's that middle, it's that middle of the road type of an asset that I think is what we're after. And, and I think some of those institutional guys are starting to kind of come down into our playground because a lot of that big stuff is gone you know oh, what I mean? or, or it's tied up right now. It's not, it, it, you know, it started another cycle going forward and, you know, I've just never figured out how to underwrite a rent increase in there. And I don't know how they really do that, but man, you got an apartment that's three grand a month to rent. How do you, how do you just, I mean, how do you write a 3% increase into that every year and, and going, it's just tough. Gotta be tough. Gotta so. be tough. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting. You bring, kind of bring up that differentiation between that A class, kind of what I hear is institutional, AKA A class, maybe down to B, B plus class. Um, yeah. property or quality. even triple A, if you call like a triple A or double A, I mean, yeah. something that's, something that's <laughs> Far superior to any of the stuff that that, that my company looks at. Anymore. Yeah, well, and, you know, people could start saying like, "Oh, I'm looking for those 2010 or those uh, those 2020 builds," and I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, that's." The, it's like, well, you're starting to get up. Basically, did you build it yesterday? You know. Um, but yeah. all that to say, it is interesting how you had this massive the last five years, last seven years, five to seven years. You already know all this, yep. but maybe the audience is is not familiar that like massive interest from the, the the new syndicator crowd like going out and wanting to scoop up and compete for the b-class stuff and then certainly when that's too expensive too tough too competitive it's gone in certain markets then they go down to the c-class because they can't really compete on yeah. the a-class and 
there's a different risk adjusted risk profile on that thing, man. Um, that, that, yep. It's just a different beast altogether. And so that's really where I can tell the you, challenge comes from for retail investors in particular. I can tell you, and I've said it on the show several times prior to like, I'm going to say six or eight months ago, I don't know that I had ever in my entire life used the word tertiary. <laughs> and that's all you hear now, tertiary markets. And it's like, I'm like, and it took me, I actually had to Google. I was like, tertiary. I mean, I assumed I knew what it meant, but I want to sure enough, it was, you know, where I live would be a tertiary markets in Nashville, for instance. Sure. And it, it was just, it was, it was one of those things. And, and, you know, and then once you start seeing that those, those markets start to really pick up some steam and, what I'm fearful of, again, as my devil's advocate position usually uh, lends itself to is, is okay, we are, the tertiary markets are the last to really feel this, this gust of wind that, uh, this mm -hmm. gust of, of, of inflation wind that picked everything up. And are we going to be the first to, to go back down? And, and again, that's neither here nor there as far as the investing and so, such as that goes. But I just, you know, like you said, the risk profiles and how I just think that some of that stuff is riskier because you don't know. There's not as much, I guess, maybe information on those markets mm -hmm. I, i'm saying there is information but i just mean it's not quite as like like you go downtown nashville you go downtown or uh, or in some of those areas in miami or orlando or some of those places like that you could literally get 500 rent comps from like a quarter mile right you come here where i'm at you might get 500 rent comps in the whole county yeah you took the words out of my mouth on the cons yeah. I mean, so it's so there again, it's just the risk profile and you have to have some underwriting adjustment for that. Completely. And this is a fun topic, man. I mean, I think one of the most confusing parts of the learning curve for the average retail investor that's out there for sure. And certainly a tough play for the active investors who are trying to make a name for themselves and build a portfolio early on in their kind of, you know, uh, syndication journey or fund formation journey is they go sure. out and they want to compete in strong markets. But what is a strong market yeah. defined as? Well, I mean, if you <laughs> grab any number of KPIs, it just really comes down more than anything else to jobs and yep. employment, you know, and, and then everything yep. else kind of spider, uh, spider webs out from that. And so here you have yep. the tertiaries and, oh my goodness, we've definitely passed on a good number of tertiary deals that had beautiful looking opportunities. By beautiful, I mean, most, mostly the ugliest type of beautiful you know you're looking at sure i understand at an, yeah, an unsigned I know. property yeah that, that classic that classic polyester curtains and the yeah. the cedar the cedar siding with the real steep root yeah, yeah. I know what you're about. But, but then you know <laughs> gunite pool yeah i mean my biggest thing i have gotten comfortable with tertiaries when and if and only when there is a least two significant sources of employment that are going to have some level of redundancy yeah. because you got these ones. I remember one deal, you know, incredible cap rate. This is like two or three years ago. And I was like, wow, you knocked my socks off with this cap rate on this deal. There's a population of 20,000 people and no sign of consistent employment. So like the moment there's a pullback, mm. that's gone. Like Forrest Gump, man. Yep. Keep running. Just keep on running. Yep. The yep. Runaway. It's all about, man. Thing. And, you know, it's just so if, if you go – Look at any, really look at any business model. I don't even care if it's a, a business model for a party planner. Uh, mm -hmm. When it comes down to the, even the marketing of this stuff, I mean, if you don't have a crowd of people and you don't have a crowd of people to, it's so, so it, it comes down to the economies of scale, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I think people are looking at these opportunities and they're saying, exactly, you're exactly, you hit this nail on the head with the cap rate discussion. And you're like, okay, so today I just had this discussion with a, with a guy about industrial, mm -hmm. okay? And he was talking about a deal that they bought at a tin cap. Okay. And it sounds great. And, they were, and I said, okay, but what is your, what's your IRR? Well, the projected IRR is, was, I don't know, he said 19 or 20%. And I, and, and oh. I stopped him. I said, my, my question is in industrial, you have a, you have, you have to figure, in my opinion, some form of vacancy mm. in the long term 
in your underwriting model. So mm-hmm. to me, you, it's hard to have a high cap and a high RR, IRR at the same time in industrial, because what if that tenant moves out, you could go two years vacant, mm-hmm. right? Carrying costs, everything else. Sure. And if you, so really, so you underwrite to that lease. And then I feel like you have to underwrite past that lease at like 50%. I mean, I'm, and then maybe that's, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's, maybe I'm being way too conservative in that thought, but in underwriting that stuff. So when you hit the, you hit the nail on the head with the cap rate. Okay. The cap rate looks fabulous today. I mean, we buy some at a six or six and a half, seven, seven and a half percent cap rate, eight percent, you know, some of these tertiary markets again, Mm -hmm. you get these higher cap rates, but how long is that cap rate sustainable for a market that went from, for instance, our home market right here, you know, our home market went from $550 rentals, that $550 rental is now like 900 bucks. Okay. And that happened in like 15 or 14 or 15 months, yeah, 12 incredible. months. Incredible. And when you start looking at, okay, that's great. That's, that's wonderful right now. But what happens when the local, uh, for instance, one of our big fabricators around here is a radiator plant. Okay. Radiator. Now electric cars don't take radiators. So what's going to happen when that, place go i'm not trying to be negative nancy about it all i'm just i'm just saying that it's, it's to some degree somebody's going to have to take in some conservative nature into some of these underwriting models yeah, now's the time for sobering messages i i completely agree that it's like time for realism um always i mean whether it's a hot market and you can kind of get by with making some mistakes get some layups because you happen to get lucky yeah. on a good sub market that grew crazy amounts like that in the middle of nashville yeah. but I mean, truthfully, I think right now the challenge in the market in particular amongst those folks competing for these bigger sized assets, at least big by our standards, you know, 100 plus unit multifamily, 100 plus unit uh, storage facilities across the Sun Belt, starting in Texas all the way up to North Carolina. Like there's so many people now that have come out and competed. And this is part of the strategy that we chose as a business. Frankly, it was that I didn't want to go and I saw there was already strong footing. There was already a set of incredible, very competitive, well-capitalized, experienced, deep track record operators out there. So I'm like, I'm not going to go out for our strategy and more power to the people that have, but like, sure. I'm not going to go out and, and out and out compete them on acquisitions, on making these offers, on yep. knowing their local markets. I'm like, what I can do is I know how to structure and uh, partnerships. I know how to go and vet deals. I know how to go and look at the economics. I know how to like basically do all that stuff. So it's a great compliment, but my goodness, there is so many people that have been fighting tooth and nail over these assets in that case. And you already know all this, but you know, maybe the, audience, sure. but, but maybe the yeah. audience is sitting there going like, man, maybe I want to go out and you know, be that person who's going to go and be the next big syndicator. I want to be the next Grant Cardone, you know, or, or, or one of, one of the big names. And the challenge is, I would say right now, if they want to go and do that, it's probably worth just diving deep on the education instead, you know, go deep on the education, build the right relationships. And then you could find yourself in really good footing. But right now there's a flood of people who came out of coaching programs and they all right now want this to be their moment. And it's like, damn, this is probably not. There's going to be a lot of deals that are done just for the sake of the deal. Right. And man, I'll tell you, that's a dangerous, dangerous, uh, uh, business model. I just, you know, people that I forget who it was wrote, uh, wrote, Oh, um, Oh, I can't think of his name. He's an attorney. He's a syndication attorney. And he said, oh, you, Mauricio, you do a deal. Uh, huh? Mauricio Rowald, maybe. Is that, uh... No, th- Mauricio, this is an older gentleman. Oh, okay. uh, I've talked to him several times on the phone. Um, like, uh, it's okay. God, I can't think of his name or not. But anyway, he 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 made that very very point in his book was if you're buying for an acquisition fee, you're going to end up getting burned. If you're buying for anything other than cash flow, you're going to end up getting burned mm-hmm. at some point. That's so, right. and and again, it all comes down to that model and like Fairless tells us to decrease the pro forma. Like they tell you, this is a pro forma. This is the rent increase. Verify the numbers for yourself. Make sure that that's what's really going on. Make sure that, because that agent is going to get paid if that property sells, he's not going to get paid if it doesn't. Right. right? So, so keep, 
keep that stuff in the back of your mind and always be on the offense. And again, I, I try not to be so negative other than I just try to be a, a, a realist, real devil's advocate that says, hey, this is great right now, but what if? That's right. What if? What if? And 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 by the time you figure those what ifs, you can really balance your risk and the risk for your investors because you know, we can all make you can make all the thousands you can make the thousands of calls it takes to raise five million dollars, but if you end up only returning four million dollars, you're you're in some pretty hot water. You know what I mean? So hundred percent. Yeah, I mean in the three um, but, I mean the way you're making this really really articulate point. You know, I hear it through through that business lens of basically like a three bullet list of things that I, I cherish now more than ever, which is number one, a number of options for regular strategy. Like number two, sensitivity analyses galore, you know, yep. so that people can just see the range of possibilities on it. How, how good or how bad can this thing go? And is it still worth moving forward? And then just scenario planning, you know, and, and like, like, like those three things, man, like they just keep. They, they, they protect everyone involved from making really uh, unhelpful decisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, that's exactly right. hundred percent. So, all right, well, listen, I want to talk a little bit about um, you made a point and I know this is a, with our listener base, this is a, a especially the beginning syndicator, right. right. Or, or the beginning um, even investor really. Um, but what you said, you have a list of, a, or you have a few hundred passive investors mm -hmm. that are high, uh, you know, higher net worth individuals. Um, I like to know a little bit about how you grew that base, how you mm -hmm. grew that, that group of that core group of investors that invest with you all and looks for deals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Happy to. Yeah. I, I think um, the first layer of it, you know, started with the way everyone does which is the first degree connections. If you want to use the social sure. media term for it, you know, you've got colleagues primarily, I would say that friends and family are really the last people to believe in what you're doing. Um, unfortunately, I, I love my family. I love my friends. That's just, unfortunately, the reality of how that all the, you know, the physics of that works and yep. they know you as one thing, not as this other new thing. And so, Yep. That was it. Well, you got to your, your moms and your aunts and your uncles. They all saw you be an idiot. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I know mine did. Mine had seen me be a moron more than once. I mean, in anything, I mean, they saw me wreck, uh, uh, remote control cars and blow up bottle rockets and whatever kind of other crap you do. So I guess right. it, man. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. And so in our case, um, we committed very firmly to a model years ago and we've held to this. I'm very proud of this. Like we basically said, first and foremost, like we were out there investing our own money anyways, but like we were, mm -hmm. we had done the rental portfolio build out personally. And this ties directly back to the question, Casey, which is bought local, realized California dollar doesn't, doesn't go very far for cash flow. Yep. We then went phase two, as we call it, bought, got up to about uh, five rentals in Kansas City, Missouri. We've since sold them, you know, they all cash flowed better. All that stuff was still not as passive as we were looking for because I was still leading teams full time in the in the W two world, you know. And sure. same with Jennifer, is my my wife co founder and COO. And so we didn't have the time to go even manage property managers because that's still yeah. rentals are passive are not fully passive. So we did all that, and then it just very organically happened where you're having a chit chat, you know, over a coffee or a, a beer or something with colleagues, and they ask, "What are you doing these days, investing wise?" And so. That was the organic nature of that. It wasn't like going out and campaigning for people. It was sure. pretty organic. So that once that occurred, we then sat down, Jennifer and I, and we said, okay, what are we really trying to put out into the world? And who are we trying to help? You know, oh, it's people more like us. So, so we defined, I believe in real estate, they often will call this the avatar. Um, yep. I'm more familiar with like ideal customer profile. And then same thing yep. for all intents and purposes here. You like yep. sitting there, truly defining as weird as it sounds, who is that person or people yep. like what is their income levels? What is their type of industry? What, what are the goals? Yep. And people like to skip this stuff, but it's deadly important. And so you do that, <clears throat> then went out and as weird as this sounds, like I went on, I interviewed no pitches intended at all. I interviewed roughly 50 people in my network, first degree connections with a set list of questions to further narrow in and, define who the heck we're going to be serving. Cause sure. it's kind of like the ready, fire, aim versus ready, aim, fire, right? Like, yep. We wanted to aim 
And when we aim, we wanted it to be legitimately helpful educational stuff for a specific group. And that, that, that was very informative to go have those, those interviews. It was really uh, quite a, a slog in terms of what was your, what was your avatar? Let's call it the avatar. Cause that is what, that's what I know it as. And I think that's what a lot of, of people know it as, but what was your avatars like job title? What did, what did they do? Yeah. I mean, were I they know. software type stuff in Silicon because your Silicon Valley connections? Exactly or what right. was, yeah, that's exactly right. So, I couldn't imagine that it would be much different, especially if you were able to go interview 50. I mean, they're just all right there, but yeah. Yeah. Man. I mean, I'm so grateful to have gone through that career for that long because I had at least some network. They didn't know me as you know the person in private equity and real estate investing stuff, of course, but, mm -hmm. but they, they cared enough and we had a good enough relationship to take me seriously for an hour, an hour of their time um, to record the call and ask them questions. Sure. So we got it down to senior software engineers, dual income, Bay area based eight to 10 years of experience in the working world, kids, you know, you've got potentially even a generation of, above them, like a parent living with them that they want to support. The reasons why they're investing happen to be that they are going to either want to have a long-term exit strategy from their own careers. They mm -hmm. want to pivot out or frankly, most people in that profile and that avatar don't want to quit. They legitimately enjoy what they do. They're making $400,000 a year per person in a dual income household. So like mm -hmm. that's the level of specificity for this fictional person who is pretty accurate and pretty reflective of a lot of the folks we have in our group. We have added a, another profile since, of course, you know, but that's really where it comes down to. And I went niche down from there where people oftentimes they find a great strategy in their own ways. So this just happens to be that we work. Um, I went in for a much deeper relationship with our investor base, meaning like, yeah, I'll do the non-scalable thing. I'll like drive sure. 45 minutes to go have an in-person coffee with a person. And that was the early, like these days, it's a little bit different, but you know, I have to still scale my time, but we went and just really built those deep relationships. I mean, and now yeah. uh, I did do this kind of prong three. I went on LinkedIn. We picked LinkedIn for social media specifically. Didn't want to spread across too many. Didn't want to go over to TikTok, Instagram, Facebook as well. Those are fine platforms, but for our strategy that this matched our avatar. So yeah. I, I wrote myself roughly 900 posts daily for about three years. <laughs> um, and I did that. Now, wait a minute, N wait a minute, wait a minute, 900. Correct. Posts a day. Not one, not, not a day. Um, no, I, I, I did one a day for 900 days. One a day for 900 days. And you posted to LinkedIn. Correct. Wow. My gosh. And then, and then, and, and you just, every one of those posts was kind of, what am I trying to like masked, masked, a masked targeted at your avatar in a way, right? Like, or were you just, were you just out there? Were you just saying like, Hey, software engineers, here's your, here's your chance to invest passively with us. I mean, what, what's, what, what were those posts? What did they consist of? Sure. Um, you know, and I don't claim to have the answer or so silver bullet here. You know, it has to be playing to strength for any person going out there, putting content into the world. And so the, there's a few themes. We did like a cloud, if you will, of here's the range of topics that I feel confident and excited to write about. Uh, number one, furthest away from investing in general in real estate is professional development. I mean, I've managed and led and coached and uh, hundreds of people at this point in my career. That was a beautiful chapter of life, really challenging. That's for sure. Management is a double-edged sword, but talk about that all day. Um, so we'll do yep. that sometimes. Uh, and I would bounce right over to just literally telegraphing our own investing moves to the world without oversharing, you know, saying, Hey, we just wired, you know, 50 K into, into a deal. And here's why we did this deal. Here's, uh, here's what we're expecting from it and why we're fired up about that. Oh, by the way, I used my retirement account on this particular investment, you know, so you're telegraphing your own personal investing, other, other topics, personal finance, uh, you've got real estate itself, uh, you've got the economy. So you kind of got that range of it, you know, but, but I think, uh, that's 
that was a labor of love. I don't do that anymore now just because we're at a different stage of the business. Uh, but sure. at no time ever did I ever write, hey, you know, hey, avatar, you know, that we're trying to reach. It was more <laughs> it was, because I think a lot of people, could, you know, kind of kind of forget about the fact that like, here, here's here's the lesson ultimately said so eloquently by a former mentor of mine. You're talking around what you have to talk about. You know, yep. that's what it's well, <laughs> um, as instead of just saying me have deal, you, you want deal. <laughs> Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. And that's that's exactly right and when you have something when you have that deal it's funny how the it's funny how the people will almost magnetize you think nobody's paying attention to what you're doing but when you have a deal and you all of a sudden you're you start spouting off hey this has got an 8% pref mm. or 8% preferred return or after you've explained as long as they're familiar with the terms and so on it's funny how then all of a sudden people are like whoa okay yeah yeah Let's let's see what this guy's got going on, and then maybe they may not invest in that deal, but they'll be watching for the next deal. So totally. Anyway, yeah, no, they well, listen, lurkers, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. And so you know that's very important. But man, that's kudos to you. I mean, that, Russell Brunson always said you post a you post a social media once a day, you'll never have to worry about money again. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly I, how. And that's, that's the hard part is like, I know a lot of morons that post to social media every day and they ain't nothing. All they are is worried about their next, their next paycheck. I can assure you. So, yeah. I mean, the, um, if I were just like to help the audience in any way, cause it's such a labor of love and failing forward, but some of those posts were awful that I made, right there. They didn't land. Yeah. They didn't get any traction, but yeah, but, but it was never yep. about me. You no. Know? Yep. And I think it's about, it's about them. It's about yep. them helping them, legitimately adding value to them. And whenever someone is tempted to sit there and I was tempted to sit there and say, hey, I'm awesome. Come work with me. Just remind yourself, you don't matter to them. <laughs> no. you're, the return does. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. They want to know. That they want to know what you're going to do for them. Period. End of story. That's right. Yeah. I mean, the, the notion of knowing, liking, and trusting is absolutely true yep. for sure. And you can't, you can't scamp on any of those three. But Yep. people because there's money involved there's time involved yeah. there's everything everything's involved everything we cherish is involved it's important stuff so, spencer listen we're running out of time here and we've got a couple of questions we ask every guest that comes on the show and the first of those questions is what is the best book that you have recently read or are currently reading you know i'm gonna have to go with the book that i've gone through three times and okay. uh, i come back to it as a reference it's essentialism by greg McEwen. And Interesting. I think it's a non-real estate, non-investing book. And it's my number one because every person out there, whether you're the Pope or Oprah or just another worker in the world, we all have 24 hours in a day, right? And, and I think that's right. Finding that time is the number one reason that people just don't take two to three years of their life, just that focus period of time. Right and do themselves and their loved ones a favor to build something that'll last them the rest of their life. And so that book gives you ways to say no to people with, so, with your social graces intact. And yep. you know, when someone says, Hey, can we get a coffee after work? Can we go get a beer? Can we go to that barbecue? You'll have time, but you got to learn to say no to people more often in service of, of yep. that focus push. So I love that book, man. It is so, such a helpful tool uh, to give you the exact verbiage yeah. even to use. Yep. And that's, and man, I, 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 I just, sometimes I want to go back and take the 22 or 23 year old me <laughs> and just kick him square in the nuts. I, I mean, it's just like, and just be like, and shake him and be like, listen, dude, look, this, you need, yes, this is what's important. Not that. And anyway, and I know man, and, by the shoulders and say, you have incredible amounts of time. Stop wasting your time. 
Yep. <laughs> and you had energy. I had so, energy. I had time. I had uh, the knowledge, but I didn't have the knowledge to not want to go party with my friends on Friday night 100%. and Saturday night or both nights. I mean, just, and, and so just anyway. to add briefly, because I know we're in the, the, the final round here, but like the one regret I would have on that, I try not to live with regret, but this is a regret I have. If I could go back to that 20 person, 20, 20 something version of me, I would say every single colleague and every single person you interact with is a potential for a long-term relationship. And it's not business. Yeah. It's not about money. It's about legitimately building that, 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 that long view with other people in this yeah. world, you know? And my God, I, I really was way, way more too, I was too transactional, too short-term thinking, too all about me, but that's the, that, golly, man, that sounds, that's almost like my story to a T transactional. I didn't know that word existed until about four or five years ago. And I was like, and, and I was having some, some financial difficulties is going through a divorce and, and the financial, you know, I'm a real estate agent by trade. And so, so once like that, that trade was wonderful and it, it, it did a wonderful job of supplying me and my family with, 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 you know, numerous things that we otherwise wouldn't have had. But then once I hit that little speed bump in life, I was like, whoa, hold on here. What's, you know, and I, I didn't, I didn't have the time to dedicate to continuing the relationships that led to the transaction that led to the, the income. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that anyway, man, I could, I could talk on that all day long, no, all day long man, about it. the transactional life is, is a, is a path to destruction. Yeah. I mean, when people ask, you know, we don't have time for this one, but I, I want to share it that like, you shared your broker experience. You know, my dad was a broker, yeah. right? And this is when people ask me, like, why do you, why am I so neurotic about this whole notion of building these income streams for our family? Yeah. And it's about building a moat because I watched his business go from a high flying top three in the entire country for a time in the 90s. Yep. Scale that income down very significantly, scaled our life, lifestyle down significantly when. My younger brother died of cancer as many years ago, hmm. you know, multiple other family members died shortly after in a short sequence, divorce, all that, all that hey, man, stuff. Life happens to all of us. And that's, and I'll tell you, when I was young prior to my divorce and prior to my, the, that leading to the, to the difficulties in basically every facet of my life, um, man, there was never going to be another bad day ever. Right. Right. Cause you're breathing. I'd make I'd make a twenty thousand dollar commission, and by God, <laughs> you know how fast could it go? And then I'd go, and then you know it was like it wasn't anything. I'd go make another twenty thousand dollar commission. Right, right, but but and it just and and then when that when that again, I didn't, I wasn't, I, it wasn't that I wasn't smart enough. I just I didn't realize that what I what I was doing to feed that yes was the little things, and once those little things stopped. It was like the brakes went on and now I'm like you, I'm like, okay, the one thing that I did learn from all of that is the importance of cash flow that right there. And I was okay until the cash flow stopped with the rental properties that I did own. Right. And once the rental property income stopped, I was like, you see that right there? I used to have a head full of hair yeah. until the cash flow stopped. That's not a fun moment. So anyway, all right. Next question. What is a dream vacation that you've either taken or hoped to take? Oh man. Um, well, um, I will say that this summer, uh, we actually did what I think is like an appetizer for the main course of what we'd like to do. You know, Jennifer, my wife, co-founder, COO, all that stuff. Like she and I, we have two boys, four and eight. Um, we took them on, I think six or seven, like pretty substantive vacations, but they were just local, you know, like local and it's in all over California, beautiful places. Yeah. But it proved the point to ourselves. We could work around the business. We could also do this level of flexibility. So next summer we're penciling this out right now. We're going to go stay, I believe in Portugal for about a month. So I think, uh, well, I'll be with your kids. With kids. Um, and how old are they? Uh, four and eight. So really highly impressionable. It'd be a nine and five year old, basically. Yeah. And um, a, I see the nine year old really, I see that. And, and, and man, I, I can't, I see it with my own kids. I, I always stress the importance of being traveled 
or being versed because one thing that I think this world lacks at this point is a lack of empathy yes. for the situations that people are in that they cannot help themselves from. And the, I, I say that because so many people, like my son was asking me yesterday, as a matter of fact, why, why are people homeless, dad? Why don't they go get a job? Yeah. Why don't they just go get a job and solve that problem that they've got? Yeah. Now I had to explain to him, there's a certain portion of them that could and just won't. Right. Right. Then there's that portion of them of the, I say them referring to homeless folks in general, but then there's that portion of those folks that have a mental disorder, right. some type of mental block, some type of mental fog that by no fault of their own is keeping them from progressing through their life or it's not keep from progressing through their life. It's keeping them from mentally being able to do what's required as like a minimum. Maybe a better, yeah, and so pleasure for him to prompt the question, right? Correct. And when you travel, when you see, when you die, when you, when you go into culture yeah. and you go into, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks in this world that can't understand the, and I step a little bit on some toes as far as some of the, some of the police brutality stuff that's always out there, whatever. Right. I've spent some time, I've been to Compton. I've been to, 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 to LA. I've been in those areas and I've seen that there is a lot of real problem with that, but you go out into the tertiary markets or tertiary areas and it's, and maybe it's not so much. So people don't understand. Right. Okay. They just don't understand what goes on. And there's, there's a communication disconnect. And I think travel and travel for your kids and ultimate submersion into culture is the way to fix that. Oh, I totally agree. How old, how did your kids, by the way? See, 13, 11, 13, 11, 10, 9, 8. Oh, okay. So you're busy. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was on the way home from there, and they're all and they're all five. They all five do sports. Um, oh, that's amazing. Volleyball, soccer, baseball. Oh, good on you. That's a beautiful yeah. family. So, yep. All right. Well, listen, Spencer, if the listeners heard something that, that resonated with them and they'd like to reach out and get in touch with you, find out more about Madison Investing or find out more just about uh, your story or, or even potentially uh, be uh, somebody to for you to run your deals by, sure. how can they reach out and get in touch with you? Yeah, just, just a pleasure of a conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Casey. So sure. we have a website, uh, madisoninvesting.com. Um, folks actually right now can go there sign up for our monthly newsletter and it's actually going to offer the chance to book a time with me just for a strategy call. And it's, it's a non-obligation thing. Really. It's just talking about the same long view, nerding out on whatever altitude is, is helpful, hopefully for them, sure. you know, and I just like to make the yep. connection with real human beings out there. So we're accepting applications yep. from accredited investors right now. Awesome, man. And that's, uh, that's, that's a great thing to be doing. And, and I know just from our discussion and our short uh, friendship here that you do in fact know exactly what you're talking about. And the fact that, uh, some of the markets that you mentioned specifically Kansas city, Missouri, are you still in that market? No, not now. I'm not against it. Oh just... man. When did you get out? Mm, it wasn't that long ago. I think it was 2020. Wow. Okay. Cause like, so from, so from then until now it's just exploding. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like everybody in there, everybody wants everything to do with Kansas. I love the Kansas city market. I love talking about the Kansas city market. So anyway, awesome. Spencer, thank you so much for carving out the time. Like I said earlier, I know it's a, it's a burden sometimes to get just a, even the slightest amount of time with everything we've got going on to be on the show today and listeners, as always, please head down and leave us a five-star review and also type out a review if you don't mind. And while you're there, smash that subscribe button so that you can be notified when we release new episodes and new content because we want to have you back. We love our listeners and we're always glad to serve you and we hope to bring you value for a long time in the future. So hit that subscribe button again. Spencer, thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you, Casey. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. 
If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.